order at 6.01 p.m. on November 2nd, 2020. Um, are there any announcements? Yeah, I have a couple of announcements for you. Um, the first is a save the date for a Route 9 corridor meeting. Um, VTrans is doing a kind of putting together a corridor plan from for the section of um, Route 9 from, um, I think it goes from Greenleaf Street to Wilmington. Um, and they'll be taking public feedback. The meeting is on December 3rd from 6.30 to 8. And I think it's gonna be a Zoom meeting. Um, we had sent something around and we'll send the reminder um, if you're interested in going to that. Um, and then- What's the date again, Sue, sorry. It's Thursday, December 3rd. Okay. Um, and then another announcement is um, there's being some work done on the existing Hinsdale bridges to think about future use of them. Um, I don't know if any of you attended a meeting mid-October, uh, but they presented some options that graduate students did. Yes, Prudence. Did you, did you I was there. Oh, okay. Um, you can speak to it afterwards, but they, they did present some options and they have a survey that they have out right now. It's the Southwest Regional Planning Commission and Keene has the survey out. I'll send you a link to it, but they're looking for some feedback. Um, they've had you know about 32 responses and would like some more community feedback from uh, both Hinsdale and Brattleboro about the future use and what are your goals for that. Um, and that are prudence if you wanna add anything. Um, no, you know, we, <clears throat> we have a vision defined and so we're not at the point of, uh, funding and things like that, but, um, I think the, 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 uh, proposals are exciting and, um, hopefully that will generate interest and potential funding down the road, um, you know, yeah. if, uh, right. in you're general, the, people seem fair. Sorry. You're on the existing bridges subcommittee, correct? That's right. Yeah. Okay, great. I think I might be um, on the project committee too, but I haven't made it to any of those meetings. So. You couldn't. I'm um, on the project could, committee. Could either of you share the link to that survey in the chat? Yes. Um, yes, I will try to get that up. And uh, there's also BCTV taped the meeting. So if you want to watch the presentations, yeah. um, you could do that as well. Can I jump in real quick on that? Yeah, please do. Hi, everybody. This is Stephen. I'm happy to join you tonight a little bit. I, I have to jump off later, but I did watch the, some of the recording. And if, um, if you didn't miss it, uh, if you watched it, Keep an eye out for Mike Kowalczyk, who is the Monadnock Regional Rail Trail Collaborative. Um, he's someone I've been working with to aspire to interconnect bikeable trails that would go across the island. Um, and if there's any way in which, um, and Sue, you may know if this is even possible or not, I'm talking with USDA about funding um, around outdoor rec assets and developing this bike path that would connect the two sides. If there's any way that can support some of the outdoor rec aspirations or that happen on the island beyond the actual construction of the bridge, but really turning it into the kind of site that we want to see um, with kind of these this design work, let me know if there's a way to incorporate that because it is that's kind of the story that USDA is encouraging us to tell is go for funding for something that interconnects both sides of the river here. Um, so. Just wanted to, to share that um, this this is uh, kind of conjoins with um, aspirations to convert this rail line into a bikeable path to the West River, right? So um, I'm excited to see these designs come out, and um, I know it's a long road still to go, but um, great to see some images for the future. Yeah, it, it would be fabulous if, um, and, and this is getting talked about, um, and Mike Kowalski is bringing it up, to, to connect the, um, the bridge, the existing bridge to the Fort Hill Trail um, over in Hinsdale. That would, be, that would be really desirable. 
And on our end, if we connect the West River to basically Whetstone Station with a rail width trail, which there's a lot of precedent for if you have just a fence and an inactive line as we do, uh, the, end, the end result could be a bikeable path all the way from Newfane to Keene. And that's pretty remarkable and could lead to great outdoor rec marketing and other things in that way. So where's the inactive track, Stephen? It's the one on the riverside. And if you, um, if you look on an aerial satellite photo, you'll even see how the train trestle bridge is a single track bridge. And the riverside track actually simply runs out and has been deconstructed. So it's a sacrificed end of a track. It can't, it really would be unlikely to be reutilized um, instantly without having to rebuild that bridge to accommodate two tracks, right? Yeah, that's not where the train runs. It doesn't run across the river there. Yeah, yeah. So and in any case, that's, um, I'm working with Friends of the West River on that. Um, and I'll be in their meeting tomorrow morning or Wednesday morning, excuse me. I want it to be Wednesday. Anybody else? <laughs> like next Wednesday, maybe. Anyways, that's my contribution to, to the bridge conversation. Thanks. Sorry, I've been multitasking and trying to. Are, are there more announcements or, or oh, is that? Sorry, we are not being Zoomed. Sorry. We are not being Sorry what? about that. We're not being Zoom bombed. Um, I was trying to post a link to the presentation and then the survey, but in doing so, I opened up the YouTube video and it started playing, so. Oh, it didn't. it didn't play for me. Oh, it didn't. No, no. You didn't all hear it. No, nope. didn't hear a thing. Oh, okay. That's, that, oh, okay. That's good. Because I heard everything, and I was like, "Wait, what's going on here?" It's not what's as this cool voice? As anyhow. Uh, <laughs> no, it was it was Patrick, but yeah. Okay. So, are there, are there more announcements? Are we good on announcements? Yeah. The only other announcement was also one that I sent you that um, on. Uh, I just posted the survey. Sorry, on November, get the date right. Um, on November 10th, which is next Tuesday, um, the town is proceeding with a necess necessity hearing and a condemnation hearing for property at 28 Vernon Street, which is the former Marlboro Graduate Center. Um, for taking of land um, for the, Hins the new Hinsdale Bridge. Oh. Um, the Planning Commission received notice of this because statutorily um, you're supposed to receive notice. So the hearing takes place in two parts. Um, the first part of the hearing is determining um, if the taking of lands or rights is necessary for the project and serves the public good. Um, so it's kind of the public necessity and convenience part of it. And then the second part of the hearing is to determine the fair market value of the real estate interest being taken by eminent domain. So there's gonna be a site visit um, at noon on November 10th at 28 Vernon Street. Um, that's just the site visit part. And then later in the select board meeting at 6.15 that night, I think they're gonna have the necessity hearing. So the first part of the hearing, um, they'll come back and, and do I think the fair market determination on another um, at a subsequent select board meeting. So um, planning commission is welcome to attend. Uh, I did forward a notice of it maybe a week or two ago, in case you were wondering what that was about. Um, um, I may have missed something. Is the town going to pay for that or the states? So it's the town's action, um, but the money comes from the states. So the town does the condemnation, but we work, you know, it's our responsibility to do it, but the money comes from VTrans. Okay. Yeah. Are there any other questions about that? All right. So those are the announcements. Um, before I stop talking, I just wanted to, um, 
let you know that Kevin O'Brien is on the meeting tonight. Kevin, I don't think he met him at a previous meeting. I could be wrong, but Kevin is an AmeriCorps service member who's working um, in this with Stephen on sustainability issues. So um, just wanted to welcome Kevin. Thanks, Sue. You beat me to it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, welcome. <laughs> um, so are there any members of the public here or any members of the public who'd like to speak? Now is the time for public comment. Um, there being none, we'll drop that item to the bottom of the agenda in the off chance that members of the public show up at the end of our meeting. Um, so approval of the minutes of our October 4th meeting, they were circulated almost directly after the meeting. Thank you, Andrew. Um, do I have a motion to approve? Make that motion to approve the minutes of last meeting. Second, the motion, the uh, minutes have been uh, motioned and approved and seconded. Um, is there discussion? None. There are a couple of spelling errors, Andrew, but I'm sure you got them. Um, I didn't note them but just because I because I figured you would go through and prove them. But okay, all those yep, in favor? Correct. I will. Okay, all those in favor of, of approving the minutes as posted, say aye. Aye. Okay. Any abstentions or nays? No. Minutes are approved. Okay, over to you, Sue. The downtown design plan. I got to go turn my stuff down to low, but I'm listening. I'll be right back. Oh, okay. Um, Jessica, did you have something to add? I did. I just uh, wanted to make a note that in the minutes we recorded that we were going to include our norms um, and guiding whatever those four points um, in our agendas moving forward. So I just want to make sure that oh. we take a note of that. And that um, next meeting, we have those four in the agenda, so we can reference them as we as we can talk about the different points we bring up. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, we will do that in the future. Um, Andrew, if you have them off the top of your head, could you put them in the chat? Otherwise, uh, yeah, I can post them there. Just okay. give me a sec. All right, I'm going to turn down the stove. Please get keep going. I'll be right back, but I can hear you. Okay, so um, just I guess before before I get into the downtown design plan, um, I just did want to point out that at seven o'clock we do have Stephanie Bonin and Amanda Whitman um, from the DBA who are going to come on and talk more about downtown and information that they've collected working with the businesses and what their needs are. So um, we do kind of have a hard stop once once they get on. Uh, but in the meantime, I've worked a little bit on some language. We wanted to give you one last opportunity to kind of um, comment on the downtown design plan. Um, we felt that we really do need to address COVID in the text of it. Um, we've been, um, you know, in this pandemic for several months now, and it seems that it would be short-sighted to not put it out there to the public with some rec recognition of the pandemic. And I also think it helps to frame um, what it is we're trying to do. Uh, Oscar Heller had been at a previous meeting saying he didn't quite understand why we were targeting this. Um, and I think with a little frame on it, it brings even more importance to the, our public spaces and how they're used and how the space is allocated. Um, so I did propose some language, um, if you had a chance to take a look at it, that we could situate to the front of the plan or even in uh, the brochure or the, um, the poster that will be created. Um, and I was curious if your feedback. I also did um, really think a lot about the title and it's the downtown design plan has always been a struggle. People really don't understand what it is about. So I wanted to propose renaming it um, to the downtown open space plan. Um, it's just a suggestion. I, if you have other suggestions, I'm, I'm open to that as well. Um, but I can speak more about what I wrote or just let you, if you've had a chance to review it, um, get your feedback on it. Sue, so I went back to the, to the plan and I was curious, where are you thinking of putting your text? 
Ah, I was looking at that earlier and I didn't write it down. Um, it, it would be up front. Uh, let me just find the, the plan. Um, I, I'm not wedded to an area, but I thought that it should be up front. Um, I, I mean, I, I almost think it should be right up front about the plan, um, kind of, which is the first little section I can pull up. I can screen share if you want to see the story map. I'm happy to do that. Yeah, no, I think that would be great. I mean, I think because I, I went back and and just looking at the front page, I mean, I had the same response that 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 we've all had in looking at it is it just seems out of date already <laughs> um, because it doesn't address our current situation. So I'm just I'm wondering if it's you know, I like what I, I you know, I, I, I liked what you wrote. I thought it was succinct. It was straightforward. Um, I like the new title. Um, and and I think it I think there's a lot um, there's a lot of words that don't aren't necessary in this plan. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm just kind of wondering how much we can how much we can edit, um, and and whether or not it's actually sufficient. And I know you really don't want me to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. It's sufficient to just change that opening and not change some of the some of the content of the plan. Um, well, I mean, we can do what we want to. I, I do agree. I mean, I think there's a lot of words and I think when we went down the story map route, you know, we thought it was a good way to tell a story. I almost think there's too much of a story going on that the real meat of it gets lost and it, you know, trying to take it in what would have been a, a written document and put it in this format, it's, it's a bit too much. Um, so I think that, you know, we can, we can make edits. Um, I, I think that's fine. Um, and ideally, you know, it'll get turned over to us and we can, you know, make those edits as well. I mean, right now I'm still working with Brandy, but there will be kind of a cutoff on that. Um, but it's not like, it's not something that we can't edit as well. But I mean, if you have suggestions that we want to talk about tonight, I'm, I'm fine with that too. So is it a living document? Can we continue? I mean, we, we, it, it can't, it, at some point it has to be ossified, right? I mean, once it's voted on by the select board, we can't make changes to it anymore. Right. Correct. But, you know, I, I also feel really strongly that we're comfortable with the plan that we put forward. Um, so, you know, if we need to keep working on that on our own and, you know, chopping out bits and that kind of thing, we can, you know, we can do that. Sorry, can I just keep talking? I'm, I'm not being chair now. I'm just being person. Um, I was looking at the pandemic toolkit. I don't, I'm sorry. There are so many emails that are going. I, I, I'm assuming that you sent that pandemic toolkit that we talked about whatever week that was that was not this, this week. Um, yep. because in, in relationship to that toolkit, there's just so many, there's so many cool, interesting ideas that it seems to me that if we do have some small bandwidth to be able to actually integrate some of those cutting edge ideas into this plan, that would be great. Um, and maybe that's, I don't know, I mean, now I'm just sort of talk, talking off the top of my head. If we, if we have more time at another meeting where we've actually, people have gone through the pandemic toolkit and per, perhaps after having had listened to what Stephanie has to say about how businesses are doing, that we might choose some of the things mm -hmm. in the pandemic toolkit that we say, well, those are the one, you know, like the three or four of them that we could with some simple modification actually get them into the plan. Um, is that too much to ask? Yeah. I don't think it's too much to ask. I mean, at that point I might look at um, my budget and figure out that we do need to hire Brandy on to do these additions, but that's okay too. Um, we do have some 
budget for consultants. So um, I would just say, I do think it's an extension of what the original task was, but it's, you know, whether Andrew and I can do it or whether we need somebody, a, you know, a consultant to help move it along. But I think that's, I think that's okay. What do the rest of you think? Did any did anybody else have a chance to just? I mean, I didn't I didn't scour the pandemic toolkit, but I sort of sifted my way through it. Anybody else look at it? Sorry, Prudence, you're you're on mute. Go yeah. ahead. When was that? When was that sent out? I don't know. So, was um, that, did that one get sent out before the other meeting, the the October meeting? Um, okay. Or was it the newer one? Are you talking about the one that I sent you when we met last week with Sue? Yes. 22 steps. All right. I'm putting it in the chat right now because I do not think that was sent out. Oh, poo. I'm sorry. All right. I take Good. it all. <laughs> I'm glad my yeah, memory's not that bad. Recall <laughs> seeing anything either. It's we, I mean, it's very cool. <laughs> There's just a lot of really interesting, I mean, there's a lot of really interesting ideas and, and really the kind of work that I think planning commissions do. So it, 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 it's exciting to actually find something that we can dig our dig into and, 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 and utilize. At least that's what I thought. Um, so Tom, sorry, you were gonna say something. Oh, just the same sort of, um deer in the headlights uh, mindset as Prudence had about this whole thing. Okay. So then does so Felicity, sorry, now that we actually have this in front of us and we can like take a moment to figure out what you were talking about, can you repose your initial query here with this and what this has to do with the story map or the- Well, that there, there are all there are suggestions in here. I'm hearing, a, I'm hearing an echo. Why am I hearing that? Um, that to, to, to alter public space, to all, alter open, open spaces. I mean, and, and, you know, I mean, I think we're all, you know, when we were, when we were originally talking about making some changes in response to COVID, we didn't have a sense of the time frame. We now, I think, have a greater sense of the time frame. could be as much as five years. Um, so it seems to me to be like we should we should dive into this pandemic toolkit and look at some things that we actually think are appropriate for Brattleboro, um, particularly around. I know you mentioned Sue um, rezoning commercial spaces, so that so that to make to make it more possible for people to use their own homes as as money as ways of making money for small um, cottage industry stuff. That seems. That seems like a really great idea for our community, um, and there are there's a there's a I, there's something about about zoning in terms of people who can cohabit, which I have to say I was caught completely taken aback by the notion that we have any kind of regulations about who can live with who. Do we have that? We don't. We okay. don't in Brattleboro. That's not uncommon. Like how you define a family or how many unrelated people can live together. That is, you know, that is used elsewhere, not in Brattleboro. Okay, good. I will move on then. Um, I was going to tell a story. I'm going to control myself. <laughs> um, but so so that that's all that's all is that is that in looking at this there are all there are commercial and zoning issues that that seem to dovetail cl clearly with with what the plan is suggesting about about just shifting up um, transportation routes and and opening things up for for bike ped that that but it but in this plan it's specifically focused towards the pandemic which with a, a couple of tweaks here and there, we could make our plan look a lot more like it was, it, it was addressing the pandemic, which as I think we've said over and over again, that, that's such an important thing for us to be demonstrating that in fact, we are concerned with the pandemic and we are understanding that we have a role to play in, in hoping, helping Brattleboro to survive um, in the face of it.
So I don't want to take, I mean, I don't think it's necessary for us to, you know, to, to, to look, I mean, I, 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 I should have, um, check to make sure that you guys all got this um, or else not read it myself. <laughs> yes, Jessica. <laughs> um, it, just, it, it has so many amazing things in it. Um, I, I really definitely think we should have a conversation about it um, and maybe also include um, Stephanie in that conversation or um, so one of the things that makes me think of is that the, the downtown um, option tax made more income than projected. And I wonder if there is a way that we can utilize those funds to make some of this possible. Um, yeah, so I guess it's a conversation with Stephanie first but um i could i could see us having another meeting more dedicated to this stuff um because it, it's great a lot of it's really great who who who, who has control over those funds so who who can who can the select board. them the select board okay the select board yeah. Other thoughts? Also about Sue's language and the and the renaming of the downtown plan. I like the renaming and I like the language as well. I don't see how we can I can't really pull up the toolkit on my little iPad here. So I don't think we can talk about that with Stephanie tonight. Right? I mean we are we are we would need a separate meeting or whatever, but. Yeah, Does, I agree. I mean, I think, I think maybe getting it out to all of you and sharing it with Stephanie too, she might be familiar with it, but she might not. Um, but it would be better for her to be able to see it and, you know, maybe have an informed discussion. And even if it's, even if we have a discussion with her, I mean, we can see if she can come to the December meeting, but if not, you know, even if we get a little subcommittee together and have a Zoom conversation with her, um, that could be useful too. Yeah. Tom, I'm gonna throw you under the bus a little bit. I think you'd be great on that committee just because how much you like to dig into the code um, work. And there's a lot of that um, in the recommendations. I'll think about it. Send me more, in, send me more info. Um, okay, so so how should we proceed then? Is it sort of a, we're postponing this discussion until we have examined the pandemic toolkit? But well, did Stu need? Do you need a decision on that proposed language change, like in the short term? Um. Yeah, I mean, I think that would be helpful if you like the proposed language or you want to see tweaks to it. I think that would be useful. Um, the pan, you know, yeah, the pandemic toolkit, I think we should spend more time talking about it. Um, and, and maybe, um, you know, some of it might, some of the zoning stuff might fall outside of the area of the downtown, but obviously it, it helps with the recovery. And zoning is another piece that we did want to spend a little time talking about. Um, but yeah, any any direction you can give me on the language that would be useful. Okay, so let's shift to let's shift to the language. Let's just start with downtown open space plan as opposed to the downtown plan. How does everybody feel about that? Everybody's thumbs up. Good. Okay. Great. We have changed that language. <laughs> um, and then when, has everybody seen the, the, the Google Doc? This plan explores improvements to existing public spaces, et cetera. Okay. Yeah, I, I like part of me wants to de-emphasize the, the, the COVID piece of it. Um, mostly because it does focus, like the actual plan and things in it focus on 
the public spaces and connecting them and, and improving them and increasing them. And it, it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily a short-term response plan. It's like a long-term thing and continuing to frame it that way, I think is important. Um, though I guess like if it's tied to another message or piece of work that we're going to launch into to support pandemic response, then I think that that could be noted. But the plan itself, I think you were saying Felicity, the plan itself um, isn't being changed all that much to address or to incorporate pandemic related language, right Sue? Um, yeah, I mean, well, right now that's correct, but if we spend some more time with the pandemic toolkit and find some things that we want to add in there, then, then yeah, it would change a little bit. I take your point, Jessica. I mean, it's true. I, I think we might be able to accomplish a lot by simply taking out the opening sentence of the third paragraph that says the COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated the value of public spaces and just say public spaces provide public health, et cetera, et cetera. And then we just have COVID-19 referred to in the last paragraph. And when we talk about public health, everybody's gonna know. <laughs> yes. That's such an important issue these days. Um, so we don't we don't need to beat them over the head with the COVID-19. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I was thinking the same thing, exactly. How do you feel about that, Sue? I, I, I agree. I think there was a good point. I mean, these are important aspects, whether it's COVID for COVID-19 reasons or just general, you know, quality of life. So I'm, I'm fine with that change. Okay. Um, so Jessica, how do you feel about the notion of us, of us actually changing the plan a little bit more substantively in order to, to in, use the opportunity to integrate some of the um, pandemic toolkit recommendations? Or would you just prefer that we finish with the plan and pass it on? <laughs> Part of me just wants to like wrap this phase up. <laughs> Maybe something we could include like about a like being responsive to current conditions and adapting uh, new practices and, and being willing to incorporate that in the long-term plan. But I think that this is a long-term plan and we need to acknowledge and accept that this is not, this is not a pandemic response. This is a, a downtown vision. Others? Okay. Was that an answer? Did I answer you? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, 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 I totally see your point. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking practically in terms of getting funding. Um, and so, so I would imagine that for the next number of years that the funding is directly going to go towards things that can respond directly to, to economic development vis-a-vis -vis pandemic, the pandemic, the pandemic. Um, so I'm just sort of thinking about the notion that we, we, we potentially could say we just completed a plan and it's full of all these things that are specifically related to the notion of keeping us economically viable within, you know, within the pandemic. But, but, but that's, that is really the- We're like, look how smart and forward thinking we are. We want to celebrate our downtown public spaces. We wanted to do that before they became essential to <laughs> economics. Right, right, yeah. What about the, what do the rest of you think? Yeah, Kathy. Uh, I'd agree with Jessica. I feel like it would be good to complete this piece of the larger zoning puzzle and then um, you know turn our attention to this pandemic toolkit I feel like there are things in there that might apply to larger areas of the town and I'd rather sort of be able to take the time and have kind of a like a more comprehensive look at possible zoning changes um, and then I think those two actions or you know the, these can kind of work in tandem the idea of 
<laughs> downtown plan and additional zoning changes to address kind of our current situation, our complementary actually. Tom Prudence? Yeah, Tom. Yeah, I'm, I feel a little split. If, if it's true that changing the wording around to address COVID will make this plan more effective in getting funding and actually becoming tangible in some way, then, then I support that. But, but other than, than that point, I'm, I'm definitely up for putting this, this one to, uh, to rest once it's, once it's, um, once it's solidified and then moving on to, you know, to, to in-house ways that we can educate ourselves about, you know, like the, the uh, pandemic toolkit and changing, doing what we can within our own regs and planning department. So I don't know, I feel split based on what you two have said. Prudence? You, you're Prudence, you're muted. Sorry, duh. Um, it sounds like, I, I guess I would like to see us, you know, get the move move the plan along and I'm I don't want to get too bogged down if we start to add a lot of new ideas and so on um to it but if we can have the language in there that that you know recognizes a pandemic um I guess I would vote more for that than to delay finalization of the plan you know for a kind of indefinite period of time I wonder if there's a, a place to put as part of this downtown plan and use of public spaces that we will look at, um, the planning commission will, will look at zoning and design and um, permitting and other, other ways that public spaces can be used and accessed and not just use it as like here's the design that we want to do, but like put in the plan that we're going to make a plan to use the space and and decide how that works. I was kind of thinking along that lines, Jessica, with um, you know wanting to move this forward. Like when I look at the pandemic toolkit, you know, there's some stuff about outdoor dining and design guidelines and stuff like that. I think in our public outreach and, you know, even the conversation with Stephanie and Amanda tonight, you know, maybe they're going to have some feedback about how the parklets worked and, and that kind of thing. So I think we can still tailor what the um, implementation plan looks like and put some of that stuff in there to kind of direct the next steps um, without having like a, you know, a whole new section of the plan. Right, we will clarify these things, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. or, you know, look at implementing them. Let's have some design guidelines. Let's, let's take a look at how the town, you know, permits use of, you know, the sidewalk or, or this or that. So where- We can draw that out as we just see that reach. So how, how, how long will that take? Would do you mean making those changes or doing the you know the outreach piece, getting it before people getting their reactions? Is is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if we if we if we just sort of approve the language tonight and essentially say mm -hmm. it's we're done with it and it could go on its merry way towards the public process and select board approval. Um, what, what else would happen to it while it was on its merry way? Um, what we, you know, we'd get it before people. Um, Andrew and I have talked to Brandy about shooting some videos uh, that we can put up online, you know, get some, you know, so people could watch it and then know how to interact with the plan and what the purpose of it is. Um, so, you know, we took November, I mean, I can't say it would all be done by December, our first meeting in December, because it's really early and there's the holiday this month. But if we, if we move to that, then I think, you know, at some point in January, we should be ready to kind of take it to the select board, which would work 
you know, for the most part, they're not going to really have time probably until the end of January to interact with it. But, you know, for the planning commission purposes, we'd kind of be on our way. We'd have some discussion about the outreach that we're, um, and the feedback that we're collecting. Um, yes, Jessica, is that your hand up? It is. It's my hand. Call on me. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I, um, I forgot about the public input process that we need to go through before the select board. And I wonder if that could be a good way to shape how we might implement the, the toolkit pieces um, that they recommend. Yeah. And so, so it might not need to be a separate thing. Um, I guess that was, it, I, I think that I guess was, the, the that public was input is if, if it's on its path and people are putting things into it as it goes, isn't that, doesn't that do what you wanted it to do? Rather than us doing a parallel process, we just use the public process as a way of... of yeah, I think that, that can be the way to do it. Okay. Um, okay, yes, Kathy. You called on me before I even got my hand up. You're like, yeah, no, I can see from the look in you your eyes. You can read my anticipation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, what occurred to me was that, so we would be having this public input process, but then there's also the, there's gonna be a public input process around how the existing bridges, how to use the existing bridges. Also probably in December-ish, there may be some public meetings. Oh. And these are both, you know, the, the use of that space is referenced in our plan and they're both kind of mm -hmm. outdoor space things. So I just putting on that on the table really for Sue and Andrew in terms of thinking of like whether that's, they complement each other or can support each other, you know, those two processes or, and make also making sure to not have them conflict with each other in terms of the timing. Yeah, I think right now they don't conflict with each other. I think that they're actually proposing pretty similar active street um, on Bridge Street. The um, existing bridges work now is being done, you know, it's kind of being moved forward by a graduate student at UMass. Um, right now, I'm not seeing any conflict. Let's put it that way. They might look a little bit different, but. Um, no, I would just literally mean conflicting in time. Like they're attempting to set a public meeting for I think December 2nd or 9th or something and just making sure that we're not choosing the same evening. And or, you know, is there a way to cascade like the public outreach to say there's this and, you know, for people that we're engaging and there's this, you know, um, and try to see if we can ad advertise or market both or promote both together or something. Yeah, I wasn't thinking they were conflicting in their content in any way. Yeah. Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, I'll take a look at it. I mean, I don't know because it's, yeah, I'll take a look at that. If they're good suggestions, see if we can't make something like that. Work. I'm, I'm wondering about in terms of the public, I mean, thinking about the public outreach and preparing people to be thinking long term when so m much of what we're doing right now is just managing to get through each day. Um, so I guess, I mean, th that's a sort of general question about asking for public input into any kind of future planning that, 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 I mean, you know, particularly right now, it just seems like, can I even plan to be somewhere on Wednesday? <laughs> you know? Um, so I'm just, I, I just wonder about whether or not anybody is really going to be able to put their, wrap their mind around the future of Brattleboro five years out right now. Well, I think, I mean, it, it may help that we could frame it as something that we could begin on and begin implementing some at least policy and use changes for the spring. 
when people will want to do outdoor activities and dining and um, business again. Um, so that might be an incentive, like let's make it through this dark winter and we'll have a beautiful spring and we'll be so supportive of everything you want to do. Just tell us what you want to do. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I hope I'm not too naive, but I think that there are a lot of people thinking forward on, on different issues because, you know, we see the community impacted. So whether it's, you know, tight housing market, um, expensive housing market, or it's, um, you know, businesses that had experience with parklets. I mean, I think at least some input, I think people would be willing to give. And the Hinsdale Bridge is coming and, you know, so that that is going to change. So there, I mean, there are people thinking about it. I, you know, could be a bit of a challenge to get the public's interest, but I think that's unlikely. I think that, you know, when you have sh images to show, you can get a reaction. Um, so I think we have that with this plan. Lauren, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just gonna add the, um, yeah, I think the adding of, of how do we re-envision our outdoor spaces during COVID, especially during, um, you know, like, yeah, during a time when that's the safest place to be, uh, to socialize. Um, I think you can tie a lot into uh, drawing people to re-envision um, a space that not knowing, uh, not knowing what the future will look like and the importance of outdoor spaces. So I think there, you can definitely tie it, tie it strongly to the, to the present day in terms of uh, uh, wh what people are going on through and get, get people excited for the, the future of out using outdoor space um, and what that could look like. Uh, so I think that, I, yeah, I, I think if, it, I think it's all in the wording. Uh, I think you can definitely word it in a way to be able to get uh, public interest in uh, to this. If it's, if you really are drawing people out, to help re-envision and reimagine how we all work together and share community in a time of separation. So, Sue, are you, do you feel confident to move ahead? Do you need more? I do. You want? No, I, I, I do feel good. Okay. Um, I am curious, Felicity, and I, this might cut into, depending on when Stephanie and Amanda jump on, so it might um, cut into the housing and zoning. Um, but I'm curious to what, you know, if there are sections that you think could be removed from the plan or other planning commissioners think it's, it's just too much. Because, uh, you know, I tend, to disagree, I tend to agree with you on that. And I wonder if you have ideas of what you think should be taken out. Anybody else want to take that? I mean, yeah, Tom. I, I don't have anything prepared on that right now, but I would go through it and, and speak to that later. I'd go through it with that in mind. But I don't have thoughts on that right now. Same here. The, the only thing that off the top of my head I can think of, and this was based upon our conversation the last time we looked at it, and, and because I'm speaking, I mean, I'm thinking just out of memory, I've forgotten the specific specifics but it's the bike route at the top of the at the top of downtown so when it when it comes down and crosses over and it's all very abstract and there's a part where it has to sort of pass through somebody's parking lot or something like that I would take all that out just because all it, it, it's so you know it just seems it seems forced um, and and it and and unrealistic that that any that, that we could ever make that happen, and 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 I think it's you know ideally you want to be able to get a whole path going all the way straight through town. I think I just think we need to be honest that we can't do that with bicycles. I mean that, that this town is so weirdly configured, um, and it has such narrow roads in various parts that that we're gonna have to do demo work in order to get a really satisfying, satisfying safe bike path that goes through the entire town. Um, and just from my recollection and from our conversations, I think that was, the, that was one of the weakest parts of the plan. It just felt, it made the plan feel like it was somebody trying to shove a 
square peg into a round hole. And I think the rest of the plan is, isn't like that. And I can go back and look at it and be more specific with the language, but I'm seeing some nodded heads. So I, I, I know that some of you are remembering that section. Yes, Jessica. I think the, the one piece about it that I do like was that there's this theme that goes through all of it that de-emphasizes um, car use. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I, just the fact that that's in there was sort of another like, support for that idea that maybe we don't need all this parking and we can turn these like cement playgrounds into uh, actual nice open space for people to use um, because people do walk and use bikes and here let us show you how we're going to accommodate them so like I liked it for that but it is true that it seemed like a real square peg round hole kind of situation for it was just, yeah, it wasn't working for me. The way that every piece of it seemed to try to fit around that idea that this is the way around. Um, and the idea that maybe maybe downtown businesses might not like a way around um, the main corridor of downtown. Mm -hmm. Just That's a good point. Yeah, so I'm with you. Yeah, yeah I, didn't, I didn't like the way around and I'm, curious about what other you know bike riders think about it which will get in the public process but it it just didn't seem it didn't seem like a good use of funds to try to have these little two-way bike lanes on two different streets they, it was it was too fussy it just didn't seem like it would be used or that we would ever really build it Yeah, Kathy. I was I was scrolling through it while you guys were talking, and I I agree. Like the framing of it, of the way around, like this, uh, you know, I think it has some challenges. But as I was actually looking through what's on the the site, it's it's really like description of these spots. Um, and I don't i don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. you know what i mean like it's maybe if we remove the way around idea but like there is something in the description of these spots and the potential for what might happen there or what it might look like you know um which i think is valuable so i don't know if you know, I don't know the editing involved to go around like piece by piece and figure out how to change that. Um, I think we have to go, I think you have to go through and look at it and then decide how that might be edited out. But so, I wouldn't want to throw that whole tab, you know, that whole section out because there was a lot of good information there about um, some interesting you know, redesignable places in the downtown. Sue, what do you, yeah. what, what do you, do you want us to actually go back through it and be much more careful and thoughtful in, in editing it? Or would you just as soon let it go? Um, I don't care either way. I mean, I think the, the comments that you're making about the way around are, you know, it is kind of the key organizer for the document. And part of me wants to just take it out to the public and get the feedback. So then we feel comfortable taking it out or reorganizing it in a way that I think Kathy's right. There's lots of the way it's organized is you hit the spot and then you kind of get more information about what can happen there. So I think it is a bigger redesign to kind of take it out right now. Um, but I, you know, I also hear what you're saying about the north end of Main Street is that it seems fussy or, you know, I, I, I don't disagree with comments I've heard from Prudence or from you and Jess. Um, I just don't know. It might be just better to put it out there and, you know, maybe we're going to get a visceral reaction from the community and, um, and then we do have to tweak it um, and pull it out or reorganize it. Okay. Um, Can I send two cents here? Yeah, yeah, please. Who is that? This is Steven. Hi. Oh, 
sorry, you you didn't turn yellow, so I, I couldn't identify your voice. <laughs> oh, no problem. I'm sorry. Um, so just just to say, I am so sympathetic to, to this conversation because I see how hard we're trying to make something happen within certain parameters. <clears throat> and the one thing I would just point out is that if it's not possible within these parameters, um, what would be the next step, right? And I know the rail with trail is not, um, it's not a cheap prospect, but if we're talking about having a main line that connects down to Main Street and is bikeable, it doesn't have the off ramps and the, the flexibility of allowing someone to, you know, um, hop off at any stop along the way. But that is the, the way that I see uh, that we're finding a mandate for almost by there not being other ways, right? To give that kind of bike ped access direct downtown to where the museum's already building its thing, where the bridge project is going in. Um, so I know it doesn't solve everything, but it, to me, it seems like the most available artery that we have to work with for this kind of activity as expensive and audacious as it may be to work with the railroad and get it done, right? But um, I just wanna highlight that, that it's, I hear more and more reasons that I need to keep pursuing that as lofty as it may be, frankly. Hmm. Okay. Um, I, did everybody else grab hold of the values and equity document? so that we can just follow up on our pledge to check what we're doing against our values. I'm not seeing any nods. <laughs> Andrew did put the link in the chat. Yeah, yeah, no, so I just, I pulled the document down and I, I, I'm, so it, and I put it there. So I was just thinking that we should probably just check it before we, before we move on. Um, get into the habit of, of looking to the, so there's distributional equity, who benefits and who loses from public goods. Um, this should be a major part of the focus of fair housing and efforts to support affordable housing. Structural equity, how to overcome historical racism and institutional racism that has often been reinforced by city planning, et cetera. Trans or intergenerational equity, consider how decisions we make affect opportunities for future generations. Procedural equity, how do we include members of affected populations, not only in outcomes, but in representation at the table and decision-making? Um, and then our values, belonging, creative innovation, connectivity, vitality, diversity, sustainability, togetherness, equity, equality, ownership, and happiness. Are we good with that? Yes, okay, good. <laughs> um, so so the, the plan is add your, add your language, Sue, and um, we'll send it on its way. And here's Stephanie. Yes, Tom. Just, I, I assume since that's a draft that Sue wrote, th there's just a few little, maybe I can email Sue. There's a, a, few, a few missing words and articles and things. Okay. Yep. Please, please feel free to email me. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I just want to say I'll I'll be more and more active as I learn what what the hell I'm doing. Uh, so <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely I I'm kind of flying in new. So I'm going to spend a lot of time, uh, listening and trying to, to get a grasp of everything that y'all uh, that we all do. So um, if I'm not responding, it's because I probably don't know quite what's going on in different places. And I'm still trying to do a lot of reading to try to catch up with it. Well, feel free to yeah. ask any question. That's fine. Yeah, and Doran, um, Andrew and I would be happy to meet with you offline. Um, we usually try to do that with new members. So apologies and we'll bring you up to speed on kind of what we're working on too, so. I mean, I gotta- Thanks I gotta for hanging in. I, I jumped in, uh, you know, a little bit early, so I, I have gotten a little bit of a, a softer cushion in uh, to what's going on. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we should probably shift over, um, postpone zoning and housing yet again, um, since our guests have arrived. Welcome, Amanda and, and Stephanie. Stephanie, you just moved. No, so there you are. Um, you jumped screen. <laughs> um, so do you do you know us all, or should we introduce ourselves to you? 
I would love an introduction. Okay, um, I'm Felicity Rete. I'm the chair of the Planning Commission. Uh, Tom Mosikowski, been in town three years on the commission too. Jessica. Hi, I'm Jessica Gelter. I've been on the planning commission, I think since 2015. And I've lived in town pretty much all my life. Prudence. Hi, I'm Prudence McKinney. I've lived in town since 1991. And I've been on the commission, I think, maybe two years. Or is it one year? I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> hi, Stephanie. Hi, Amanda. Kathy. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Amanda. Kathy, I've been on, I don't know, Sue. I've been on the com planning commission, I think, like a decade. Is that possible? Not that no, long. No, you can't be a decade, but it's <laughs> at least seven years. Maybe. Okay, <laughs> something like that. And I lived in town since 2005. Doran. Hi, um, I, hi Stephanie. Nice to see you. Um, I am uh, uh, brand new to the uh, to the planning commission as of October. Um, I am Dummerston, born and raised, um, and I went away to travel and um, go to school. Uh, but yeah, so I'm but I'm a I'm a lifelong Southern Vermonter. Um, and and our other guests, Kevin, um, Andrew, and Stephen, you wanna. Kevin, go ahead. Hi, I am oh, new, really new to town. Uh, I'm an Eco AmeriCorps member um, that is now with Stephen and the Planning Department's new Sustainability Coordinator position. And I took the long way to Southern Vermont. Most recently, I was in um, Southern Africa and Zambia with the Peace Corps doing tree stuff. So happy to be here. Andrew. Hi, I'm Andrew. Uh, I work with uh, Sue in the town plan department and I've uh, officially been living in Brattleboro for over a year. And Stephen. Hi, I'm Stephen Dotson. I'm the sustainability coordinator and I've uh, been in this position since February. Um, so. so over to you guys. <laughs> well, let me, let me just put a little context on it. So. Um, thank you for joining us, Stephanie and Amanda. Good evening. Um, we're happy that you could join us. Um, the Planning Commission has been speaking a lot since the pandemic started about what are the needs of um, our businesses, particularly in downtown, but other small businesses in the community. Um, and kind of we're early um, on encouraging the select board to consider uh, parklets and other um, you know, tools to help businesses, um, you know, be able to survive in the early days of the pandemic and that were so probably important to them this summer. Um, and they often are asking me, you know, what's going on with the businesses? What are the issues? And um, I mentioned the one-to-one -one project. So um, this was the invitation to come here about how is it going for our downtown businesses? And then, you know, what are their needs and what are things that the planning commission then um, should be considering, so. Great, thank you, Sue. Um, thank you all for inviting us. Uh, what we thought is that I would give a broad picture really quick of DBA just to make sure that we're all on the same page there and give a quick intro to one-to-one. -to -one. And then Amanda is going to delve just a little bit into um, more of the data and the numbers of the experience, and then we can go back to where we feel like we're at and the question, which is a great one of what can we do? Um, so Downtown Brattleboro Alliance is, is the downtown organization that represents the DID, the Downtown Improvement District. And I love that I get to represent businesses, organizations, and residents. So we are not just, we are not a business association. Um, and part of also what I love is that we are based on a geographical area, not based on membership. Um, and so that gives me huge flexibility to be able to really not be chained to a specific roster. Um, 
I have an incredible volunteer board, uh, which Sue is part of as a non-voting member. And um, we meet the third Tuesday of every month. Um, just going back, our budget at DBA is from a special assessment tax of the business owners, as well as lots of fundraising that we do. So that's sort of the general picture of DBA. Um, like a lot of organizations and people, COVID um, put us in a position of needing to both act really fast and also be innovative and also be forward thinking. And what that did for us from the very beginning is that I realized that all of these webinars that were coming out and these massive, what I call wholesale um, speakings were great on some level to get sort of a general picture, a general assistance, but uh, what our downtown really needed was to go way more pinpointed and say to people, pick up the phone, connect with people, see where we're at, where they're at, and um, see how we can help. And part of the reason um, that they needed that is because we all have been asked to do things in this moment where we have no idea what we're doing. Um, it's like, sometimes I describe it as being a um, executive director or a parent or a business owner um, at a PhD level when we all kind of operate a little lower than PhD. And so in order to get them the support and the tools fast to do things they had never done before, like applying to pages and pages of grants. Um, we knew that we needed to really connect on a one-to-one -one level and be able to meet them where they're at. And so that was how the one-to-one -one project was born. And uh, I pitched that idea to a funder and they said, yes, run with it. And that was when I was able to hire Amanda and we tag team for quite a long time in, in delving into this project. And before I hand it to Amanda, I just wanna reiterate something that I say to Amanda a lot, which is this was always the ethos and the, and the values of DBA. We just had to magnify it and work really fast because of COVID. So that's my big overview, Amanda, take it from here. Oh, thanks Stephanie, you did a really beautiful job of, of giving that overview, I appreciate that. Um, as Stephanie said, back in March when the pandemic began unfolding, we started having these conversations around how to support our downtown businesses through this crisis. We knew we had to act fast. Um, we were hearing projections that somewhere between 40 and 60% of businesses would not survive the crisis. And of course, we felt that was completely unacceptable. Um, so we started with an initial goal uh, that we would do our best to ensure that 80% of our downtown businesses would survive through at least July 15th. And um, I think I'll just jump ahead in my notes and say that we have over a hundred businesses downtown and um, currently only three of them have closed their businesses for good since the start of the pandemic. Four others have closed their storefronts, but they continue to do business with the hope of returning to downtown in the future, which is an incredible success. And it's far greater than the 80% goal that we set back in April. Um, obviously the pandemic is nowhere near over, but we're feeling really encouraged by the resilience that we're seeing in our downtown businesses and by the impact that our support seems to have had on the outcome. So far um, from what businesses are telling us, what we're doing has been extremely helpful to them. So I wanna go back and tell you a little more about, little in a little more detail what we have been doing since April. Um, so as Stephanie mentioned, the project is called One to One and there are kind of two things that that name reflects. One is our practice of reaching out to and following up with um, downtown businesses on an ongoing basis, personally and individually, um, to 100%. We've talked with all of our downtown businesses. We're really on top of that. We've got a spreadsheet. We just keep track of all of them. And by creating a communication network that helps local businesses connect with each other. Um, I think that... Uh, so anyhow, we so we've been reaching out repeatedly and persistently to provide downtown business owners with human encouragement and support so that they feel like they're not lost in the sea of information and all these new things that keep coming out, connecting them with resources and essential information, helping identify their needs and helping them come up with creative solutions, 
walking them through strategies for successfully hibernating during the shutdown. This was a big topic of conversation back in March and April. And then reopening safely and sustainably to whatever extent possible during whatever the guidance is at the moment. Um, helping them navigate the mandates and guidance and helping them to pivot flexibly as things change. So that's ongoing work. Um, and the way that we're able to do that is by talking with them all the time and keeping our finger on the pulse of what they're concerned about, what they're seeing in their customers, what it is that they feel they need. And um, as I'm sure you know, Vermont business owners tend to be independent and self-contained. It's not necessarily their first reflex to reach out to each other or anybody else to, for help. So that's where we come in. Um, we have um, a, an online Facebook group for downtown merchants that is one of our primary vehicles for communication aside from phone calls and emails and just trying to stay connected in all the ways we can. Um, and that membership of that group increased by over 100 members since March. And there are uh, frequent conversations among business owners um, on that platform and we share information that way as well. Um, such things as when sanitization questions began coming up, we discovered that one of our downtown business owners happens to have a significant expertise in sanitization um, and was able to provide a lot of peer information and support. And another example is when the PPP loan deadline was extended, a lot of businesses who had originally thought they might not apply reconsidered. And so we were able to very quickly pull together a, a Zoom call so that those who had a success story with the PPP could answer questions for those who were still on the fence. And they did that for each other. We just kind of set the time and date and they just showed up and did an amazing job of supporting each other. So we believe that the habit and value of these connections will last well beyond the scope of our project, but also that it's really a necessary thing to get through the current situation. So as, um, as I've mentioned, we have worked really hard to help our local businesses access and navigate the relief funding that's available through the federal and state programs. And um, by our fairly close and intimate knowledge in some cases of each business's situation, um, we've been able to provide them targeted help in, in, in quickly in making sure they know what funding's available, what the deadlines are, the requirements, helping them figure out whether they qualify, whether it's something they want to apply for, helping them get answers to their questions, encouraging them to keep going through this difficult, this exhausting time. As Stephanie mentioned, some of those grant applications are pages and pages and pages. And it has resulted in something I think of as application fatigue. So just reaching out with a phone call and saying, hey, I'm here for you. I, I can't even count how many people I've actually sat on the phone with them while they filled out their application, just so that they could get a sound, have a sounding board for getting some questions and things figured out as they go um, so that they would complete it and get that funding. So of the over 100 businesses in our downtown, at least 61 of them qualified and applied for, uh, qualified to apply for either the IDLE grant and loan or the PPP loan or both. Um, and I don't have a number for how many received it, but I, would, I believe at least two thirds of them received some federal funding. And at least 43 of our business owners applied for the first round of Vermont recovery grants. The second round is currently in process and we're helping businesses navigate that in the last few days of um, application there. And as a result of these of the support we gave them, many of these businesses received funding that they were not sure that they qualified for, were not sure how to apply for, and it's enabled them to keep their doors open. We also provided significant support for them in accessing pandemic unemployment, which even though it was meant for personal expenses ended up being used by a lot of businesses just for to stay afloat until they could get that federal and state funding. Um, uh, as Sue mentioned, the Parklet program was um, came out of a response to um, restaurants concerned about reduced capacity. And we were able to act quickly to help facilitate the conversations with the town around this project because we had these close relationships with the business owners. We already knew their situation. Um, and uh, you might re remember the posters that started showing up in business windows um, early in the reopening period that were titled Keeping Our Downtown Safe. Um, those, we created those posters, but they came directly out of conversations among business owners who wanted unified messaging downtown for a safety protocol that everyone would know what to expect. So we heard their concerns and helped bring it together and make, them, make that happen. So um, we continue to provide strategic support, emotional support, and flexible solutions, even while we're heading into an unknown future. 
Um, we certainly believe that our help has been um, pretty important to our downtown business community. And we do firmly believe that Brattleboro is gonna survive this. We want the best possible outcome that we can ensure. Um, the vast majority of our businesses are hanging on. And many of those business owners have told us that they would not have remained open without having the DBA and specifically the one-to-one -one project in their corner. Um, I just wanna end with a quote from one of our downtown business owners who said, thanks to all the help I've received applying for loans, grants and unemployment, I'm managing to cover my expenses and I could do that through the end of the year, at least. I wanna play my part in keeping this great town viable so I'm not throwing in the flag yet. And that's really um, something that we've heard over and over from business owners who've said, I was gonna give up, but because you were there and you helped me figure this out, I'm hanging on, I think I can make this work. The question we often ask them is how long do you think you can hang on? And earlier in the pandemic, some of them were saying, I think I can hang on for another month. I think I can hang on for six weeks, but I might have to close. And now what I'm hearing is, well, I'm sure I can hang on through the end of the year and possibly into the new year. I'm not sure yet, but I'd like to try to figure that out because I think it's possible. So um, that uh, optimism and hope is just so important as we go forward. So that's a lot of information, but that's what this program is about. And we intend to continue um, securing funding and keep this, keeping this program going for as long as it's needed because it feels like it's the right thing to do. And it's what our downtown business owners need to be able to continue. I'm also happy to answer questions from anyone now or at any time you can get me at amanda at brattleboro.com. Um, I'd love to hear from any of you if you've got questions. Thanks, thanks for having us here. So do you guys want to pose some questions? You commissioners and others. I, I mean, I have a question. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm curious what you talk about we, um, who are you all? Or is it really just you doing all that work, Amanda? It's me and Stephanie. Okay. <laughs> so it's just the two of you keeping these 100 businesses afloat. I think so. Yeah, I think we just, uh, we tag team. With the with one-to-one -one project, yes. And then Downtown Brattleboro Alliance also has an intern um, who we were also able to hire during this time who does social media and a lot with Gallery Walk. And then we have the Everyone Eats project too that we were able to hire a full-time person to support our work in uh, Everyone Eats as well. Wow, well, kudos to you for your remarkable work. I mean, we were we were quite concerned in this summer and, and it's stunning that what you've been able to achieve, really remarkable. Thank you. Um, so I guess, I mean, I, I think one of the reasons why we wanted to talk with you is to see if there was anything we could do. Um, Well, so um, Sue had asked, you know, where are we now and what can we do? Um, there is a lot, which is what Amanda just spoke to. There is a lot of um, subsidizing going on right now. And so the big question for everybody in their personal lives and in downtown is what happens after the CARES Act funding goes away, which is middle of December, to there's some extensions going on to end of December. And we certainly don't know the answer to that. Um, but, you know, for programs such as Everyone Eats, that is for some restaurants giving them 80% of their revenue right now, um, that's a big question for some of the restaurants that have parklets that are absolutely, um, you know, people like Elliott Street Fish and Chips, who has kept their capacity because of the outdoor parklet, each story is different. You know, they only had four tables inside and they got to have three, four tables outside. So they're going to, they're all, they just had a meeting, a bunch of them to try to figure out how to keep those parklets through the winter but time will tell if you all will sit out there, um, even with heat lamps, if that will work. So I feel like we're at a very pivotal point right now of mm -hmm. what is next? What is the next thing once we have all of this, what I call subsidizing taken away and how can we help? Oh, along with subsidizing, it's the, um, 
visitors, no matter how much we don't want them here, they also are the ones that um, have brought in a lot of money, especially in the month of October. And um, people definitely saw a brand new audience here. I heard that a lot from business owners that the population that was coming and visiting were very unlike what we've seen before. So, I mean, let's brainstorm. What, what could we do to when the rug is ripped out from a lot of people? I just want to say that one of the things that I anticipate happening and imagine we'll be helping with is I think that it's quite possible that we may end up having another period of shutdown or certainly closing down capacity. Um, and so one of the things that we did earlier in the pandemic, as I mentioned before, was spend a lot of time working through strategies with businesses who felt they couldn't pay their expenses. So how, how, what is it like to talk with your landlord and ask for a rent reduction? How is that go? How are those conversations going? How can you minimize your expenses? Maybe turn off your internet if you're not using it, if you've closed your doors for a while. Um, just kind of walking them through what those possibilities are for reducing their expenses down to the absolute minimum. And so that's like half of the strategy. And the other half of the strategy is helping them keep their hope up so mm -hmm. that they can hang on and believe that they really will reopen and make the most of what they're able to do, whether that's limited curbside or some sort of online offering. Um, how can they stay engaged in their own business, passionate and motivated and believe that there is something on the other side of this for them? So I see those two things as being an important role that we can help play, that one-to-one -one can help play through the winter. Um, but uh, I, I am so open to hearing anybody's creative ideas about what they imagine things might look like in a th thriving pandemic business situation in say February in Vermont. I don't know, maybe we'll find out, but uh, if you have ideas, we should talk about them. So we, uh, yeah, Kathy, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was doing some mothering here in between for a minute, so I just didn't know if if uh, you had mentioned to Stephanie and Amanda that pandemic toolkit. I, yeah, I was just about to say that. Um, so, have you guys come across this pandemic toolkit? That that um, it, it 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 has zoning issues, which is why we were looking at it. Sue and Andrew shared it with me, um, and it has. Um, it has a couple of sort of design ideas about outdoor, making outdoor spaces um, usable. Uh, Kathy just put it in the chat. Um, so have you heard of it? No, but I love placemakers, but no, I have not seen this pandemic. Okay. I mean, it, 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 there, there, there are some suggestions about creating um, outdoor spaces that, that, that people can sit outside and eat in, in freezing cold temperatures um, that are, that are worth looking at. Um, there's also, I mean, I wonder, have you guys, have you guys thought at all about um, the Montreal winter festival where it's like sub zero temperatures and in the month of February and they have a whole outdoor festival that takes place in the city. And there are sites where you can go and warm up. So there are soup sites and hot cider sites. Um, and then just a lot of, it just brings people out, brings their games and various other sorts of things you can do. I'm wondering, I mean, I, I know with social distancing, it's obviously impossible to play certain kinds of games. Um, but has that been talked about? Some way of bringing people, new people, to the to the to town through some kind of winter festival? Well, um, I I just was a part of the a ARP um, conference around winter placemaking, and mm -hmm. there was great ideas, like you said, igloos and warming and light. Um, I think the thing that's so challenging is the is the is that you want people, but you don't want people, and you want people, but you don't want people. And how do you balance all of those things? Um, and especially in this given moment that we're talking about right now, where if we had been talking about it three months ago when the valves were all opening and 
you know, capacity was being lifted. Well, now the reverse is happening, obviously in Europe, but even in the United States where they're shutting down capacity. And so it's really hard to plan, but I think they're, um, so I guess that's a long-winded answer to, I need some boosting up if people really feel that we should be creating events that rely, you know, those outdoor events, they rely on crowds and that is not really a positive word right now. And so I'm just not sure how to do that. Yeah. So I guess then the question is, is are you guys thinking creative ways of getting money? Um, in other words, you know, raising money in order to, to just simply continue to, to, to work at subsidizing at a level of 80%? Or are you thinking of ways that we can actually get the businesses to be self, self-sustaining? Well, I think the businesses are in our in a better. Let's say that the governor said that we should shut down tomorrow. They are absolutely in a better place in the sense that people who didn't have online gift cards now have online gift cards. People who didn't have shopping carts in their websites now have shopping carts. So the saying that COVID made us fast forward into the future is absolutely true, even for rural Vermont. Um, so that's good news that they're in a better spot. Um, the, we are not fundraising for direct, um, subsidies, but we are absolutely ears to the ground of what is the next relief package. So, um, the one that Amanda ref referenced is phase two of the Vermont recovery grants, and that would give up to $300,000 for an individual business. Now, you know, most of our small businesses won't get that huge of a grant. It's based on um, the loss of revenue that they have. So no, we're not looking to direct subsidize ourselves, but we're looking to make sure that we leave no stone unturned of offering support and help that's out there for the organizations and the, and the businesses. Um, I think I would most like, I, I feel like all of us, it, it, it is, how can we continue to increase capacity in the winter cold Vermont and balance no crowds? So, you know, uh, Saxons River Distillery is doing some phenomenal yurt type things. Um, some of our stores are going to try to keep those parklets open. But what are, what are we not thinking of in terms of that magic number of you know, Turn It Up Records has people waiting outside because they've hit their capacity. And so that really hinders your ability to run a business that's already barely, you know, it's not like any of our businesses are in good times, you know, flush. So I'll definitely take a look at this pandemic toolkit. Um, yeah, uh, Kevin, I saw you put your hand up and then Stephen. Yeah, um, I, uh, I was just scrolling through the downtown design plan or the, I guess it's renamed now the downtown open space plan, but has there been um, uh, thoughts about using the transportation center as kind of an outdoor um, space, kind of a booth space? So maybe it would provide some some different coverage um, and and break from the wind, but not have to have more of like the the canopy tents. Um, just a thought. I love it. I happen to love the parking garage, <laughs> and I don't know how it would translate. Um, like the top level, I've always wanted to have a concert on it. Mm -hmm. um, so how would we translate your idea to increasing capacity? Don't you guys think people would like take Peter Haven's tables into the parking garage to dine? <laughs> I, I will say that from a structural perspective, you have to check and make sure that with the engineers that, that, that the crowd, crowd, if ever there were a crowd there can be supported structurally because I know that, that, that 
cars and people are, have different weight measurements in, in the design. I was, I was already told no, but I can keep oh. dreaming. Oh, okay. About, about, yeah. the con about the concert on the top level. Yeah, that was what was making me think that, yeah, that a, a crowd of people listening to music on that top level will probably make the thing fall down. <laughs> Well, I can chime in one uh, idea that I've I've wondered about if if there are underutilized spaces uh, on Main Street, um, I don't care what kind of business they are. One thing that we know is that the rest of life does not happen if school doesn't happen. And to me, there's this kind of um, interesting mismatch where school is going to have to come inside too, as much as they can, or they're going to need to find spaces that they could flex out into. And transportation is the real challenge logistically for them to utilize more of the community. But if there were a way for schools to utilize underutilized spaces among businesses and provide a baseline rental income, and we had a pot of grant funding that went through DBA to help supply that to the schools to help them essentially subsidize through rental income, we could uh, partner with Brooks Memorial. I know STAR has been very keen on having a system to check out community spaces, right? And we could do an analysis of how many people could safely fit within social distancing and protocol requirements and have that be a part of the catalog. If you have a group of 10, 12, whatever it is that could fit in whatever space. Um, the problem currently is that I know all those spaces would love to be rented, but they have their own little process and you have to know the person to get the reservation and, and do the thing and the schools don't have the money and that part. So um, maybe the schools do have the money with some of the CARES Act funding. Um, perhaps that's not one of the impediments, but for the planning commission, is there any conflict in use? Is there any piece that we can play to create a pathway that this would be more likely to happen? Um, but in any case, Amanda, I, I always send crazy ideas to Stephanie. If you'd like to have a phone call, I'm happy to share some of my crazy ideas with you. And Stephanie, you got to watch that video before I quit on that currency idea, okay? No, 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 no. It's not, I will, I will. Awesome, thank you. Uh, boys and girls, add, add, before Sue answers that question, boy, add boys and girls club to that list of big spaces that could be utilized for school. I know they're on it. Great, oh. thank you. Sue, were you going to respond to that question? I was not going to respond to that question because I think I need to think about that a little more. <laughs> um, but I, I was thinking of kind of the underutilized spaces and maybe allowing um, businesses to have pop-ups or whatever in them. So, you know, we've heard that Dottie is going to be closing. Sorry, I don't know. Do you hear my feedback? Yeah. I'm not sure why I have that. I don't generally have that pro problem. Um, so yeah, I was thinking about unutilized spaces. I was also wondering if if the parklets don't work because snow plowing becomes an issue, is that somewhere, you know, something like where you look at taking half of Harmony Lot to set up some warming stations and seating? Uh, because I think, you know, people should be, are going to need to take it outside, you know, they want better ventilation and, you know, we might have to dress for it, but, but maybe we take part of a parking lot and it's easier to keep that clean than, you know, plowing around or shoveling out a parking, a parklet. Um, yeah. And as course, soon as I you said that, the town letting you do that, but I'm just throwing it out there. But you know what, as soon as you said that they liked that idea the least way back when, but now so much has changed in, there was a lot of fear when that was first presented around um, COVID spreading on material things and who had to keep it clean in a ultra sanitized way. So I wonder actually if that would, if we could reintroduce that idea and, e and even just rebranding it as a warming station makes it, it feel like it makes so much sense to me. Um, not just about dining, but also just about downtown enjoyment. I like that. Uh, Torin. Uh, the, a couple of um, non-traditional places I can, I'm thinking about. Um, obviously the, the tunnel into um, Harmony parking lot. Um, I'm thinking about the Main Street flea that they just did. 
Um, so having small winter uh, flea markets in that type of sense um, in some of these possibly not more non-traditional spaces, uh, like the alleyway down to uh, patio coffee, um, as well as like areas said that would be partially kind of covered by wind, at least, if not from um, rain or snow. Uh, also, you know, I think about, you know, that you have the, the dry cleaners at the corner of flat uh, or the old dry cleaners that's now shut down, but they have a lot, they have a lot there right on the corner. It's like, you know, bars, I think about Kips and McNeil's are going to be who knows how long, but like that, I don't know if any type of deal could be worked out for that to be like a, a parklet in association with it, with, with one of those bars or with like outdoor dining. That's a really nice downtown space that could possibly be rented and used. Um, that's, that's there. Uh, that's very close. Um, yeah. So those are just some of the, the, not the, I don't know. I, th I love the idea of getting non-traditional with things. I think it's very easy because we get very stuck into things that it, it takes a pandemic to, to kind of wrench us out of our normal uh, thought process with looking at stuff. Um, yeah, no, I, I yeah, I, like we could, you, and instead of it making it necessarily a carnival that draws lots of people, I, I honestly think we're going to have tourism straight through the winter. We are the safest place in New England right now. Even when our numbers go up, we are like the low ones. So I think tourism is just going to be the entire time. And the question is like, what interesting things can be created? Like, instead of it being a carnival, it's like carnival lets, you know? But you, like, you don't, like, if we're thinking about it in terms of like taking that, but assembling the crowds and making it a little more of a trickle, doing little things like like talk to Julia Tadlock or about more Main Street fleas throughout the winter. Um, yeah, the idea of like keeping stations with just like a couple of, of, of like, you know, the, the gas, um, the, you know, the gas lamp, lamps where people could warm up. Um, you know, you could come up with some creative ideas. And I mean, I don't know, like, in terms of, yeah, working with the bars about ways for them to do a little bit more, having little outdoor closed off sections that are that, um, at least fenced off. So like that is part of that that place, that establishment. So obviously not no one can wander in there. You have to go through all the, the regulations of that, but having a place for outdoor, um, for outdoor meeting, because right now Whetstone is really it in terms of that sense. So just some ideas. You know what, maybe the frame, maybe I was getting stuck on capacity when actually maybe the problem is, is that people will be out in the winter and they won't want to stay in the, in the stores for too long because it's in an indoor space where the, where COVID can be transmitted. So maybe we should focus on keep on these warming stations, keeps them downtown longer because they're able to warm up in a safe spot. And so it's not actually about an event or about bringing the stores outside. It's about keeping them hot. It's a fire pit in Pliny Park and a warming station in Harmony and a, the, the places you named Dory are all private property. So that, not that we can't do it there, but it would be not the planning commission isn't, is my understanding. But so, Kind of well, like. just on that point, if, if I can just be way outside the box and Sue, this is when Sue reels me in, guys. I just have to let you know. That's why she's there. She's my boss. And we, the Conservation Commission oversees a piece of land that's next to Whetstone Station by the river that's broad and open. It's a brownfield site. Could it be a bonfire site? That's the most Vermonty thing I could think of. Just I know. What's the site? Um, or other sites similar to that that have, you know, uh, proximity to downtown. Um, that, that to me could make sense. So let me leave that there. I had one other thought I wanted to share. Stephen, can you clarify what, which site are you talking about? Oh, I'm sorry. Next to the Hinsdale Bridge, the Barrows Oil Building old site. Um, the town holds it currently. Uh, it's um, been remediated because it's a brownfield site and capped. There's a bunch of uh, pieces of granite there just to sit on currently. Um, mm -hmm. It to me, it's within our, the town's purview as opposed to private property and could be one of those um, opportunities since it wouldn't be too lasting of an impact so long as 
you know, as far as I understand, I don't think it would mess up all the brownfields work that we've been doing to, but what do I know on that front? So this is where Sue reels me in. <laughs> yeah, well, a bonfire might be fine. The only correction I'd make is that it's overseen by Rec and Parks. So um, not, not the Conservation Commission, but yeah, I mean, that is a site that's municipal owned. I have another point too, but if, if you wanted to speak to that, Stephanie, I didn't want to try and add too much at once. No, go ahead. So I, I think you guys are right to ask the question, you know, what just makes people comfortable downtown? Where, where do we have the ability to provide that safe social gathering? Because we know we are going to be a destination, right? The first hub in Southeast Vermont on the highways. But to me, we may be missing a critical piece of the market and a way to encourage people to visit us safely, which is to say, people are gonna to have to come and quarantine here before they can actually get out and get downtown if they're doing it right, right? And it could be that we could enable restaurant meals to be delivered to them in quarantine. Is there an opportunity here around virtual shopping to, for these folks in quarantine or bringing them, bringing Main Street to them somehow? Because I don't wanna be encouraging people to come out and be social either and not you know, follow protocol just because we're the easiest place to get in Vermont, the safest state in the union, right? So to me, there's there's some interesting things that could build on us creating a hyper-local delivery and hyper-local commerce here that connects local producers and, you know, craftsmen and restauranters with, with folks who need those things or are looking for anything to do during quarantine. And I'm speaking as someone who is currently in quarantine, so... <laughs> That's, that's the one part I would say, there, there could be opportunities there. Yeah, I, I wanna piggyback on what you were saying, Stephen. Um, I think Dory and I know a lot of folks our age and younger who are moving back to Vermont, even temporarily as well, that, that need a, a place and need that two weeks of uh, quarantine. So it's not just travelers, it's also bring, bringing our children home. Um, but speaking, speaking of Dory, another <laughs> idea I had, and, and this sort of like runs in a theme of, of activating the downtown and creating opportunities to spend time outside there, creating recreational opportunities. Um, Dory has often run a fun curling club on the retreat meadows during the winter and I wonder if something like that um, if you work with the fire department to ice part of Harmony parking lot or something um, could be created there's where there's a pop-up recreational site or activity in the downtown that might also you know not just stand around and get warm but like do something active and get warm um and also uh I mean technically we we do maple syrup jug curling. So we fill maple syrup jugs with cement. And that's uh, what I'll be keeping myself busy with my friends this winter on the retreat. But the idea of that being uh, the, it's just, yeah, uh, the, the fat maple syrup jugs filled with cement slid on ice uh, is, that's, that's trademark by the way. Um, but yeah, no, yeah, the idea that, that could be a community uh, spot doing something of that shuffle board, something of the sort. Also giant chess, but I don't know if we have that much space. I love, love the idea. Winter, stay on winter sports. Um, Tom. Yeah. Um, I keep hearing about the capacity of indoor spaces and trying to um, allow businesses to regain their former capacity by utilizing outdoor spaces. But I wonder if there's anything that can be done. Well, so with the Re Wyndham Regional Commission, one thing I remember at the last meeting that Chris Campany, the director mentioned, was in the office, they, they have very reduced numbers there and they're in the process of getting air filtration systems to you know, make the air changes much more frequent and to filter out 
uh, microbes and particulates and everything. And so I, I don't know if the at the state level, the governor, the administration recognizes businesses that might do things like that and allow them to up their capacity. In addition to, I don't know, like, I had an idea back in March about doors um, that swing both ways, so you don't have to grab them with your hands. But the air filtration thing seems like a really, um, it, it would turn the indoor air into approximating more of the outdoor air because it would it would have greater changeover, which is why we think outdoor air is safer. So. To that um, point, Tom, just so we, we know there's a lot of money right now being put into exactly that especially for the schools. And in fact, every technician that, um, that I've heard of is booked with that work for the schools specifically. But the other side of it that we should be aware of, when you have air flowing through your buildings that quickly, guess what it means for your energy bills and for your heating costs, right? And so it, it brings up the issue that these folks, they may see gains in business, they're gonna have to confront really leaky buildings and really inefficient systems and heating costs, so. Sure, sure yeah, I mean, as with expanding to outdoor spaces and building structures and fire pits and warming stations, it's a, it's a comparison of costs and expenses that every business has to make to decide what's the best route. Yes, and there was a, a um, bill that we were following closely that would have given funds, grants to businesses um, in order to do these things, whether it's furniture for parklets or um, going up on the roof and doing outdoor dining, you name it, and it didn't pass. They tried a couple different incarnations and they didn't pass and air filters would have, a filtration system would have counted in at least one of those bills that we were following. Um, I did want to amend my statement a little bit in that a lot of the population doesn't even care about those capacity numbers. They just don't feel safe inside. And so we're, we were also looking for outdoor to meet their comfortability, their desire, their public health needs. So it's not just about the sign on the door. I should have said that in the beginning. Okay. As um, well, I'm sure the safety of the staff and making sure that that they're not going to be part of that, um, put at risk or, or you know, become part of the community transmission locally. So a apropos of that, how is the um, the curbside pickup working downtown? I know we talked about that in the summer of sort of making parking, designating parking space specifically for curbside. Is that a, a component that's been working out, or is that not worked at all? So that worked phenomenally, absolutely phenomenally when we didn't have parking um, um, restrictions, jurisdiction, they weren't ticketing. They, um, and it, it, it was a huge lifesaver for the businesses in easing it. And I know of at least two businesses that have already asked the town, could that come back for the winter? And the answer was no. Um, I also wanted to touch on the delivery service. My heart sank a little bit seeing that DoorDash is coming to town. Um, I would love to see an actual independent um, system. I know that a lot of things have been tried and I don't know, I can't speak to why they haven't worked, um, why the restaurants haven't been able to band together or any retail shop to deliver things to people's houses. But DoorDash usually takes 30% off of the bill as their as their fee, and so it is not a sustainable. It's it's made for big cities, and even then, it doesn't work. But big cities, it's like a loss later. You know, you get them with one delivery, and hopefully, they'll come back and support you. Um, but yeah, I don't have anything good to say about DoorDash. Wow. So, is there anything, Sue? Is there anything we can do about the parking and extending um, the li liberalization of parking through the winter, as per the request? Why is that? Why why have the has the town reasserted that? Um, I'm 
not really sure. Um, I can look into that and see. I know that that was a decision made. I think it was not a select board decision. I think it was, uh, well, it was a department head. Um, and I think it's just because the time when it was working before there, we weren't, um, you know, the parking was not being enforced. And so the whole system was shut down. So there really was no enforcement anyway. Um, I wonder if there is a way that restaurants or businesses could collaborate or consolidate pickup spots. Because I know there were spots in front of every business early on in the in the pandemic, but is it a parking issue, do you think, Sue or, or Stephanie? I think it's probably a revenue issue. I'm not sure. So I, if I remember correctly, those the 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 people who who staffed the parking were on furlough. So presumably, those people have been taken off furlough, which is why the that's correct. Required. Okay. Yeah, all right. and I think it's fear. If if one has it, then they're all going to ask for it, and then you're taking you know, and the and the idea is to keep the parklets as long as you know it's working with snow maintenance that you know, the town is willing to, to have the parklets. Um, so it's the loss of more parking spaces. Um, you know, I don't know so much the number or the revenue. But, but, but as we know from the open space plan, we don't need as much parking as we have downtown. <laughs> um, yeah. So if we want, I mean, you know, ultimately our, our plan is to reduce parking. Um, so we, and we haven't even bothered to worry about the fact that that's going to reduce revenue. We are just assuming that open space, more, more open space is a good thing. And so we're planning on taking some of that parking offline already. Um, it seems like we might as well do that now since it serves both, both needs for giving us more public space in addition to giving the businesses more flexibility for curbside pickup. And, and yeah, I mean, I'm willing to, to bring it back up at a meeting and see if we can't make some movement on it. I'm not the only decision maker on that, though. <laughs> Is there anything we can do, we planning commissioners? Um, go ahead, Kathy. Sorry, I was just thinking like, I wonder if there could be a, a, a parking sponsors, right? Where like maybe a private person or even a collection of businesses purchases the uh, one parking spot for a month to support the businesses in that area. Cause I, I would imagine that the revenue you know, for one thing, it's a, it's a way for people to contribute if they have the means, but it may also be that the revenue that you could gain from having access to that parking spot where someone can drive up may be more than the actual cost of the spot. So that it's kind of a win-win, like you're providing an, a, an opportunity for the businesses to have like a quick drive up spot, but the town is also then not losing the revenue. And I, and I kind of feel like, you know, you, you have to actually look at the map of the town and identify like which spots and how many and what the cost would be. And then maybe there's a, some way to, I don't know, figure out the cost benefit of those spots. Yeah, I mean, I think the idea of kind of looking at a map and maybe identifying some and, you know, spacing them out through downtown that multiple restaurants could use, um, you know, could be an effective way rather than a piecemeal, you know, each restaurant comes and, and asks. Um, I think there's some options in there. I guess my question to Stephanie and Amanda would, would be, you know, things like that. So curbside is obviously becoming an issue. Are there other things that the business owners are requesting that the town can be doing? Or are they mostly just focusing on their business survival? Um, I, would, I would say that we're 
looking for the next big idea, I think, which is why we don't have a list of asks because we're transitioning. There was a little bit of a false hope that winter would be okay. We're transitioning way away from that. Um, when I say that, I mean that uh, no one, we weren't all operating that we might go back into a shutdown. And so we were all, the collective conversation was much more around what should we do um, if it continues like this, what, what does the winter look like? And we were kind of stuck in that questioning phase. Um, and so I can't believe I don't have like a big ask for you, but I think that this conversation has made me think about things in a different way that I really needed. And so maybe, maybe the outcome is actually, um, will create the next big thing. Yeah, and we're here every month. You can always come back. <laughs> One of the things that I definitely was hearing like a lot in this conversation was use of parking in downtown for other things. And I think that, you know, if the planning commission or Sue wants to take any action between now and the next time we hear from you with your real big ask, we can definitely, you know, dig out that good old parking study we did, but also be really staunch advocates for the need for that space for things other than cars. Um. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, that you didn't really talk about everyone eats, Stephanie, but you did mention the 80% figure and we know everyone eats at this point is ending in December and, you know, that's, our restaurants are going to need every assistance they can get. And, you know, if giving up a parking space is, you know, a, a minor thing, but it's really critical to them. But, you know, I'll definitely push on that some more. Tom. Yeah, um, Stephanie and Amanda, one thing that we did, uh, the planning commission and planning department did, I don't know, was it back in got the select board to vote on it, uh, to approve it back in June maybe, was an interim, two interim bylaws and they were in response to COVID. Um, I don't know what effect they've had now and maybe it's hard to measure, but presumably we could, you know, move around and edit and modify a lot of things in the 250 pages of regulations that we put on this town. Not, I'm not, and I, there's no, there's no, um, I'm not insinuating that that's too much or anything. I'm just emphasizing that there's a lot of potential material there. And um, if either of you or someone else feels like they have some free time and you have the mindset of um, that you do of um, being the best proponents and advocates for businesses downtown, maybe you can read through those things and say, hey, I think this could be changed to this and it wouldn't be uh, chaos, it would just be better and then propose it to us and we'll see if we can make it effective ASAP. Kathy, you had your hand up before. Do you? Yeah, I guess I, I just wanted to say as we were talking, I was imagining, you know, I was thinking of like, we've gone a couple times, the strolling of the heifers hosted the like love crawl in the river garden and um you know and i it made me think of like closing the street and and having vendors out and stuff i almost wonder if like you could make downtown you know the thing is people don't want to go inside the box right but they need to be warm so it's like if you can if you can help people to flow through the space of downtown where they can be warm and they can quickly access spots to spend their money, right? You buy an, a hot apple cider here and then you see t-shirts on the street and then you, you know, maybe you can pop into this store or then you get a chocolate or whatever and things are accessible. Um, you know, so in my mind, it's like, okay, well that you need open fires, right? You need, 
you need less parking really because you need people to be able to move through space and have places to gather around a fire. Um, you know, I was also kind of thinking of like in New York City, some of the flea markets in winter where there's like literally like this is maybe in the 80s, whatever. But, you know, like a fire in a big barrel and you just go and you buy the chestnuts and there is like the cultivation of the outdoor space. So to a certain extent, it may be that you envision that and then you say to Sue, can we do that? Right. And if there are regulatory obstacles for that, we can then try to figure out how to adjust them and get the questions answered about how many open fires we can have in a five block radius or something, but. Kathy, yeah. I just wanna say that uh, I think it's Elliott Street. Is, it, is that correct, Sue? In terms of um, if there was a stretch of downtown that we have precedent for shutting down the street to allow for kind of an open bazaar kind of environment, which is what I hear us talking about, like a winter bazaar. Um, Elliott Street is the most apt for that in terms of not blocking off traffic and you know we have purview over it as opposed to state jurisdiction over Route 5, that sort of thing. That's correct. So just to plant that seed, and that's the most street. likely case. We've done Flat Street too. Yeah, I, I we have done Flat Street. Um, there is more comfort in, in Elliott Street with several of the different departments. Thank you so much. I'm leaving totally inspired. Um, I could, do you mind? I just, I, I feel like I have kindred spirits in the parking garage that I didn't know I had. And because I feel so just for two minutes, I just want to make sure you know a project that we're working on. Um, so we also used your parking study all the time to talk about how we don't need more parking, we have more than enough, but we know for me, we feel the answer is that people need to love and embrace the parking garage in order to make that summary statement actually true that we have enough parking. And that the premise is, is that people hate the parking garage and so they don't even count that as parking. But um, one of the things we're meeting with um, Sue and Patrick and um, next week is we got a grant fund to continue our work on teaming up with the Ask the River artists and the, and the sculpture that's gonna go on that parking garage. And we are the ones that did the Alley Lane project, mm -hmm. um, this group of us. And so the next incarnation of this is a pop-up um, art gallery in the elevator on the first Friday in December. And so the idea is to totally, Jessica, change your perception of the elevator. I saw your face. And so the idea is that you make it into an art gallery and that we would have a station at each level for a different type of activity. Um, but you, the doors open, you peek in, and it's actually going to be a, um, if we get permission, a um, miniature, like an installation of what the, the, what the permanent sculpture is going to look like in the parking, in the elevator, so that you'll get a glimpse of what that will look like. And then each of the stations will have things like, you know, um, take a selfie with the upcoming sculpture or make a comment about the new signs that we hopefully will be putting in the parking garage, stuff like that. Um, so I, I hope that you hear more about that project and that you like it. Great. Um, so it seems like you, you thank you guys for coming and thank you so much for the fantastic work you're doing. We really owe, owe you everything. Um, quite remarkable. So, and we're, as, as Kathy says, we're here the first of every, of every month. So please come back. And if, if you come up with your big ask, we're ready to hear it. <laughs> uh, bye <laughs> so um are we are we uh are we prepared to adjourn or is there more business we need to do so do we want to there do is not, there is not um, more business but if you all want to talk, I mean, we did skip over the housing and zoning. I would suggest we save that um, for December. Um, but
but it, you know, it's up to you guys what you want to do with the meeting. Somebody wants to make a motion that might Can be. Would you like to make, make a motion, Kelly? Yes. Can I just jump in real quick? Yeah, please. Go ahead. Thank you. Just regarding the housing and zoning, I just want to say we should maybe make it a priority because I know Tom's really been waiting to come up about these things. And I'm really interested in talking about a few of those topics. So um, just a shout out from staff member. I just think it's super important. Thanks. Okay. We will, we, well said, Andrew. We'll, we'll make sure that that's at the top of our agenda in December. Okay. I would like to make a motion that we adjourn. I'll second. All those in favor of adjourning. Okay, we are adjourned. Stay safe, everybody. Good luck tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, yep. Good luck. Bye-bye.